Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. Today, we're going to talk about financial risk and how it can and should be managed. To set the macro stage, we are living through one of the riskiest and most dangerous moments in the financial and economic history, in my estimation. And I say this with some certainty because today the prices of assets in financial markets are being elevated by the incredibly distortive participation of central banks. With the Federal Reserve pouring hundreds of billions into bonds, the prices of bonds are no longer reflective solely of investors' perceptions of risk, especially inflation risk. The yields on fixed income securities have declined markedly, and in many cases, they're the lowest they've ever been in our nation's history. Forced to chase yield elsewhere, the prices of equities are bid up by return-hungry investors, elevating the risk of disappointing, if not punishing, future returns. Even worse is the idea that central banks are now providing a permanent backstop to all financial markets, utterly distorting, if not destroying, the concept of financial prudence. After all, if the Fed is going to prevent losses then more and greater risks can be taken. So how should we be thinking about risks in a world where the entire concept has been so utterly distorted? What does the past have to teach us, and what new things do we need to consider? More specifically, what can and should the individual investor do to optimize their chances of keeping, maybe even growing their wealth, while prudently navigating the growing and, in some cases, brand new financial risks? Today, I'm pleased to be speaking again with the team at New Harbor Financial. Today, we have Mike Preston and John Loger with us, who will help us answer these questions and address these concerns. Before we get started, I'll make it clear that Peak Prosperity has a commercial relationship with New Harbor Financial, one in which fees are shared on referred accounts. It's important to note that this arrangement does not result in any increased fees charged to the end customer. You're charged the same as if you walked in through the front door. All the details in this arrangement are provided clearly in writing during the referral process. Okay, Mike, John, welcome to the show. Good morning, uh, Chris. Thank you for having us. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Hello. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Okay, let's begin with New Harbor Financial Group's philosophy towards risks and risk management. Who'd like to take that one? I'll kick us off here, Chris. This is uh, John uh, talking. Uh, Thanks, folks, for listening. So, um, you know, we are investment managers and and we are financial planners. Uh, All the principals of of the firm here, myself, Mike, and our our third principal, Bill Cole, are all certified financial planners. But cutting through the uh, the typical titles that one might uh, call folks like ourselves, we really view our our primary job as being that of a financial risk manager for clients. Uh, Quite simply, we want to protect our clients from the inevitable, sometimes swift and large drawdowns that happen in financial markets, and of course, we want to help them capture gains when, when, when gains are being handed out. Um, you know, it's, it's quite uh, a common theme in our industry to just accept market risk and, and deal with it by, you know, staying in the market until things rebound. Uh, that's not quite good enough for us. We, we do think that uh, risk can be observed and measured and that defensive actions can be taken to uh, protect clients from uh, you know, undue uh, risk and, and potential large downside. I, I, I can't recall how many how many conferences I've been to with with uh, peers in my industry where I've heard something to the effect of someone saying, "Yeah, the market's down 25 percent, but our clients are only down 22 percent," uh, as if they were taking a victory lap. Um, that to us is just unconscionable. You know, relative outperformance like that uh, doesn't cut the mustard to us, and it shouldn't cut the mustard to our clients. You know, we certainly expect more from from ourselves and our clients should. Uh, it's not an easy task to uh, to uh, you know avoid risk altogether, uh, and and we, we don't want to project that we can, but we do think that large drawdowns can and should be protected against. You know, our primary day to day focus is on uh, what we'll call investment or portfolio risk, you know, and, and that really comes into play as as we are hands on investment managers. But we also re- recognize there are other risks in our clients' life, financial lives that uh, go beyond their their financial portfolios. And this involves, you know, risk to their their health, their livelihood, uh, you know, any any non financial assets they they might have, and that's where things like insurance can come into play. We are licensed to help clients secure insurance, like for example, life insurance, disability insurance, and where and when appropriate, we do so. But 
by and large, the biggest risk that folks sometimes unwittingly and unknowingly take is with respect to their financial assets, and that's, that's really our primary reason for being here. Well, excellent. So let's focus on this first type of risk you mentioned, investment risk. How is uh, New Harbor Financial Group's philosophy or approach to investment risk unique here? Let me take that one, Chris. This is Mike here. Let's talk about investment risk and how our approach to managing investment risk is unique. We really think that managing investment risk is a single most important value that we bring to our to our clients' lives. You really have to distinguish uh, between volatility and risk. People generally think that volatility is risk, but that's not necessarily true. There's lots of instances in the market that we could point out where volatility is very low, for instance, like in late 2007. But risk, by the ways that we measure risk, would be very high. There's other times where volatility would be very high, but risk would be a lot lower. For instance, March 2009 would be a better example, with VIX trading up around 50 or higher, and the market swinging 500 Dow points a day or more in some cases. But risk, as we look back now, we understand risk was lower in the longer term over that period. So right now is another good example, I think, as we sit here in January 2013. The volatility in the market or risk is really low. Risk is also sometimes measured by standard deviation. There's not a lot of day-to-day change uh, in, in, in volatility, but risk, we think, is very high. And so we have to be preemptive and decide when risk is high, even if volatility is low, and, and make certain types of adjustments to our portfolio. Those types of adjustments generally would include using special tools to hedge against that risk and could include uh, and usually includes raising cash in portfolios so that we can deploy the cash at better valuation levels. Really, that's the name of the game, is being patient enough to sit on cash or cash equivalents when appropriate and when risk is high so that we can deploy them when risk is likely to be better rewarded. Mike, what I just heard you say is that New Harbor thinks about volatility and risk as uh, potentially slightly overlapping circles, but not exactly the same thing, and that uh, a lot of financial firms may be thinking, or uh, I know personally, when I open up the paper and I read about market risk, it's almost always just talked about in terms of just volatility. And yet, when we look through financial returns over time, there are many other descriptors that need to be thought about that actually add to this total thing we talk about is risk. And so uh, New Harbor is is actively looking at and attempting to manage around a larger concept of risk. And uh, as you mentioned, sitting on cash when, when that is appropriate. So there's an element of knowing when risks are stacked in your favor and being long or, or seeking gains in those moments and having another sense of when risks are stacked against you and moving to the sidelines waiting for better returns. Is that fair? Yes, Chris. I think that's a good encapsulation of, of how we try to be different about risk management here at New Harbor. So this is what I'm interested in finding out. I'd like you to walk me through how New Harbor's investment risk management philosophy actually plays out in practice. Say when you begin working with a new client or circumstances change and you want to review an existing uh, client's portfolio, you have the sense that, that obviously we have to look at many more things besides just volatility if we want to measure risk. There's more than the beta of a stock against the market. There are a variety of other factors you're looking at. So how does that actually work in practice? Put quite simply, uh, many times we'll, we'll meet a new prospective client. We'll take a look at their their financial assets and their, the makeup of their real estate assets and their debt profile and that type of thing, and we'll, we'll advise them to obtain some physical precious metals if they don't already have them. We'll advise them oftentimes to, to pay down debt, perhaps pay off a mortgage. And, and sometimes there's really nothing left over to invest in the financial markets after all of that happens. But that's that's great. You know, for everybody, I mean, that, that doesn't necessarily mean we get a new client, but we certainly get a new friend. You know, and we're helping we're helping that person out in in the way that they should be properly. Not, you're right. We shouldn't just be thinking about traditional financial uh, assets when we think about investments. We should be thinking about you know, putting solar in your house, for instance, or you know, a rain collection system, or you know, developing the skills needed to garden. Or you could even think about buying farmland or things like that. So those are the types of discussions that we have. To give a picture of how we're different is to first start by what, uh, describing what most firms will do. Now basically, uh, most firms will have a client, a new client come in and sit down and, and 
complete a questionnaire of sorts. You know, um, that questionnaire will usually have, you know, kind of boilerplate information, you know, about the client's financial picture, you know, summary of their assets and their liabilities. But then I'll also get into softer questions such as, you know, what their goals are, what their timeline is for, for needing the funds uh, that, that are to be invested. And the, the key section of these questionnaires typically has to do with some sort of self, self-assessment by the client as to their risk tolerance. And the, the result of this kind of questionnaire, and regardless of what firm's logo is on the questionnaire, they all have the same basic effect. The, the result of this kind of questionnaire typically is translated into this, you know, quote-unquote, optimal pie chart investment allocation uh, that is deemed to be uh, uh, ideal for the client based upon their responses. Now, underlying that, you know, the science, if you will, uh, in arriving at that, that optimal pie chart is a body of academic, you know, investment theory called modern portfolio theory, okay? And it's uh, been around for, you know, several decades. Um, you know, uh, folks like Merton and uh, you know, a whole other cast of characters, you know, were seminal in, in, in building this body of academic research. And basically what that, that approach does is it looks at volatilities, as we described in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the preamble here, of different asset classes, you know, stocks, bonds, you know, uh, commodities, and so on and so forth, and looks at how those things, historically speaking, have behaved relative to one another in, in, a, in a long-term sense, okay, and then optimizes for what mix of those different, um, you know, asset classes, you know, will achieve the greatest expected return for any given level of, of portfolio volatility, you know, trying to get the most level of return for uh, uh, an assumed volatility based upon long-term historical averages. Uh, this is what sometimes is called the efficient frontier in, in academia. The problem we have found with that are, are several fold. Okay, uh, first off, you know, basically modern portfolio theory uh, assumes those, those uh, historical averages as being given. What we have seen is that the market um, often will and, and does, you know, cause those assumptions to be utterly flawed. You know, the fact that, you know, stocks and bonds enjoyed some historical correlation in the past or, or non-correlation, as the case might have been, um, at periods of extreme market environments, those correlations get thrown out of the, win- uh, out the, out the window and have no relevance because everything becomes ultra-correlated typically in, in, in major term- turning points. Um, so the, the basic uh, academic under- un- uh, underlying assumptions of these models end up being flawed. Therefore, the the the, uh, the 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 optimality of the pie chart becomes flawed. Um, other you know shortcomings of this approach are that um, you know really clients themselves are not very good at at being an honest uh, assessor of their own risk tolerance. You know what we have found um, across the board, whether clients call themselves conservative or aggressive, you know uh, we say this somewhat tongue in cheek, but it's kind of the truth. You know every client hates losing. And all clients love gains. Okay, so um, what we have seen is the most aggressive investors, or self-described aggre- aggressive investors, you know, have the have the behaviors of the most conservative investor, investors when markets are collapsing, and vice versa. The other thing is, you know, clients are, they they assume they have uh, longer time frames than than is actually the case. You know, even a 25 year old, you know, young younger client who in theory has a 40 plus year time horizon before they retire. Well, inevitably, um, their timeline is much shorter. They've got the down payment for the house. Uh, then a little beyond that, they have got, got college tuition payments due. So the, the long-term, uh, long, the time horizon assumption that, that goes into the typical asset alloc- allocation approach is usually flawed because life doesn't have uh, those, those long time frames typically for even our younger clients. And then the main shortcoming of this approach is that uh, the underlying premise of the, the market modern portfolio theory is that markets are efficient and that and at any given point in time, the market is properly uh, offering a, a, an appropriate risk premium to folks who are willing to invest in stocks or, or other risky assets, which just isn't the case in practice. You know, as we can see in 2007, folks were investing in stocks at a time where there was very little, um, in hindsight, um, very little upside and lots of downside. And the modern portfolio uh, theory just doesn't recognize that as being a possibility. So, so at major turning points, these asset allocation models end up being very flawed. Uh, on the other hand, um, and I'll let Mike, you know, explain a little bit more about this. We 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 don't prescribe to a a fixed pie chart, you know, where the idea of active management is just mechanically rebalancing to this this you know model driven uh, allocation. We we take a much more dynamic approach to uh, you know asset allocation. I'll let Mike, you know, talk about that. 
Well, John, before we move on there, so the idea here, I, I of course, had to learn uh, modern portfolio theory in, in my uh, MBA course, and I, I had disagreements with it even then because it was very theoretical. And when we get into the real world, it's it's completely obvious that there are whole periods of time when your theories can just get chucked out the window. And this may be one of those times. So we have people like Bill Gross saying recently that bonds could get burned to a crisp. And there's this idea that part of the reason that you have uh, falling um, bond yields will lead to a rising stock market is is because people are chasing the yield and going over that direction. But the reverse could be true. So that so that these assets that are supposed to be uncorrelated, we're going to give you 60, 40 stocks, bonds, something like that, because one will do well when the other's doing poorly. But there's a, an idea here that both could do poorly at the same time, potentially, and that could be a, a complete disaster. So are you saying that, that what you're trying to do is, is understand what the theories are, look at, at what history has to teach us, and you've got one eye firmly on the idea that these are absolutely extraordinary times? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, you know, um, you know, we, you know, we've observed, you know, our Fed and central banks across the, wor the world basically turn on the, the money printing presses without uh, restraint. Um, and basically, at a macro level, what, what that has done is it's caused money to chase yield in, in virtually every a asset class to the point where, you know, if you think about, you know, here's where we do think market theory does work, you know, eventually equilibrium is achieved. So essentially what we think has happened is across all asset classes, whether you're talking stocks, bonds, you know, even to some degree commodities, and you might even say in the short term precious metals, the, the money has flown so, uh, you know, aggressively into all different asset classes that the, the uh, market has ach achieved equilibrium in the sense that the, the near term perspective returns for all asset classes we think are, are very poor. That, that's by definition what equilibrium is, when, when the, the perspective returns for all, all types of assets are, are, uh, have achieved equivalency. And, and in this case, sadly, we think that equivalency is is uh, very disappointing uh, potential returns in the near term. And that's there's certainly a growing body of, of evidence that, well, I mean, how long has it been since the stock market has, has really uh, given a great return? We've got that. And you've got people uh, like Jeremy Grantham recently talking about that maybe low growth is now the new normal, and we have an entire financial system that's tuned for a very different level of growth. And so trying to think about what the long term is, is is interesting. And I'm intrigued before you mention that the long term is not 40 plus years anymore, even for some of your younger clients. It's it's the next big financial event in your horizon, which oftentimes may be only 10 years away. So I, I'm intrigued by that. Uh, um, so now that I understand sort of, I, I guess, how, how uh, other firms are approaching this and sort of a if I can say this, maybe somewhat of a cookie cutter, somewhat theoretical sort of a way. How, how does how does New Harbor really approach uh, risk management and portfolio uh, building for someone? Chris, really, what what I think New Har makes New Harbor's approach different uh, is that we we measure the risk in the environment, as we talked about earlier. We we really don't use a cookie cutter, as you said, pie chart type allocation for our clients' portfolios. In fact, we don't use what 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 most money managers would use is like an age-based model. We have a portfolio that is based upon the risks in the market as we measure them. So, you know, whether somebody is 80 years old or 25 years old, their, their accounts are going to look pretty similar because we think we should only take risks in the market when risks are likely to be rewarded. You know, the 25-year-old doesn't want to be aggressive and lose money um, just because they're 25 years old and have more years until retirement. And the 80-year-old Frankly, if the market conditions dictate and valuations are are good, um, you know that 80 year old still has a long time uh, a time frame in, in their lifetime, and they should they should be uh, taking risks when risks are appropriate. So we don't prescribe to the typical you know take 100 minus your age and put that much into the stock market or risk assets. So oftentimes, like now, when volatility is low and risk is high, we've got a very low allocation to risk assets like equities and a very high allocation to assets like cash or cash equivalents. Most of our colleagues uh, or many of our colleagues in this business uh, don't don't hold on to cash or cash equivalents, but we really think it is an investment decision to hold cash or cash equivalents because how else are you going to have the money to buy assets when they, uh, they achieve favorable valuation through a market correction or reset if you're not sitting on cash? in the first place. 
Uh, you know, one other thing I guess I'd like to tie in, Chris, is the economics of loss. We understand fully the mathematics behind the economics of loss, and we really embrace that as one of our core principles uh, here uh, at this firm. The economics of loss of the mathematics of loss are very unforgiving. If you lose 10%, you've got to make 11% to break even. If you lose 20%, you've got to make 25% to break even. By the time you lose half your money, and that's not hard to do, the S&P 500 was down over 50% um, back in the drawdown of 2008. If you lose 50%, you've got to double your money to get even. And uh, commonly, investors will panic out at the wrong time. So it's much, much better to not lose very much uh, on the downside so that you can have most of your cash available to buy when everyone else is selling. So that is a core tenant of our philosophy. Chris, if I might just elaborate, you know, just kind of thinking back to uh, the, the real-world test of the uh, the efficacy of the the modern portfolio approach. And I, I think, you know, if you look, uh, for example, at late 2007, when we know now with hindsight the market peaked, and compare that with early 2009, when we know at least in hindsight um, that we had a, a relative trough. Um, you know, basically, a given client would have been roughly the same age. You know, they, they you know. You know, a little over a year, year's worth of difference in age, but essentially the same age. So, you know, uh, two hypothetical clients that came to a traditional firm uh, in, in one in October of 2007, one in March 2009, would have been prescribed exactly the same investment portfolio. Now, anybody um, that uh, is sitting at home can realize that, you know, the markets were, you know, there was a 60, over 60% drop in the markets between those points of time. So it just doesn't make doesn't pass the sniff test that, you know, at those two extremes, uh, a, a pers- prospective client w- would have been told to invest exactly the same way under the, the traditional modern portfolio theory model. So, so that, that's just kind of a, the, the ultimate real-world test as to the uh, appropriateness or efficacy of, of that kind of approach. Richard Russell is, is fond of saying that the primary purpose of a bear market is to take the most money from the most people. And so what you're talking about is the drawdowns are very painful. Uh, Mike, you were mentioning that, that, you know, uh, first take no losses is sort of a, uh, a financial Hippocratic oath, as it were. And, uh, John, you're mentioning now that uh, dynamic asset allocation, understanding and responding to market conditions as they are, is an important cornerstone of, of your philosophy. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, you know, again, uh, more so than a client's age or what they self-classify as their risk tolerance, we're going we're gonna, to um, have a, an asset allocation across different asset classes that is mindful of our measurement of the risk-reward environment. Quite simply, we're going to be, you know, our, our pie chart is going to look like, a, you know, one that a, traditionally an 80-year-old would pursue when risks are high and one that a younger person would typically uh, pursue when risks are lower. So, you know, for example, um, where, you know, a client that might go to a traditional asset allocation firm might be prescribed a pie chart that is something like 60% bond, uh, stocks, you know, 30% bonds, maybe a token, you know, 3% uh, allocation to equity, uh, you know, commodities, and then a, a small amount of cash. Um, you know, uh, our typical clients would look much different. Well, first off, you know, uh, our clients are typically going to find a, a much more heavy emphasis on things like precious metals way more than what a traditional modern portfolio theory model would, would ever allow for. We're also going to have uh, allocation to um, assets that really are mindful of uh, the three E uh, thematics that uh, your peak prosperity listeners and readers are, are, are so mindful of, uh, things that recognize that we're in the midst of very dramatic turning points and trends as relates to energy, the environment, and, and the economy. But more than that, our clients are going to see a much more... Um, a uh, dramatic range of allocation to to things like stocks. You know, so for example, rather than holding a static 60% in stocks for for a given client through through all environments, you know, uh, our our clients have have come to expect based upon changing environments in the markets. You know, just just looking over the last seven years, you know, a typical client of ours might have seen equity allocations as low as you know 15 or 20%, and as high as 65 or 75%. Not because their age changed or their their self prescribed uh, you know risk tolerance change but the market dynamics changed you know just there were times where it made sense to be more invested in stocks like in early 2009 and times to be much less invested like in late 2007 and you know frankly we would say right now here in January 2013 um, we think there's great reason to be much less allocated to things like stocks than one ordinarily might uh, consider appropriate for themselves 
Well, excellent. You know, this really, uh, we're talking about risk adjusted returns then and, and wanting to hedge your bets such as they are, because when you have a good sense of what the risks are, of course, you can uh, create a, a relatively well balanced approach to that. And sometimes the risks are unknown, particularly, you know, let's be honest, where you mentioned this before, we're in a world where central banks are dumping literally trillions of dollars into markets and exactly how that's going to play out. We'll only really know in, in hindsight because we don't have any any guidebooks to go with here. So, uh, Mike, you'd mentioned before that that there's more to risk than volatility, and I'd like to go a little deeper into that if we could. How does the New Harbor team go about gauging whether risks are high or low? Is this an exact science? No, Chris, certainly it's not an exact science. It's really a mixture of science and art and experience. Uh, markets are irrational and and they can they can remain irrational for a lot longer than than you can stay solvent <laughs> and that's that's the well known axiom of wall street yeah. but you don't have to be exact to make very good risk adjusted returns over time frankly we don't think you have to be that exact to beat most investors over time you simply have to ascertain when risks are high and when risks are low and take appropriate action you don't have to be precise in, in identifying major turning points. You only need to be in the right neighborhood, Chris. So for, let me give you a couple examples. The stock market peaked in October 2007, but you had almost another full year to reduce your exposure to risk assets. It wasn't until September 2008 that the stock market really started to plummet. And there was a lot of things going on early in 07. We had the, the, beer, the Bear Stearns collapse and so forth. And there was, there was plenty of time to adjust. There was a lot of complacency. Volatility was pretty low. A lot of our other indicators that uh, probably beyond the the, uh, the scope of this podcast were basically telling us to batten down the hatches and raise cash, and we did. On the flip side of that, you really didn't have to get in right at the bottom, the most recent bottom being March 2009. The market rocketed higher after March 2009, but there was plenty of indicators that were that were turning from red to green at that point it's like a, a picture you can kind of picture a puzzle coming together and the pieces fitting in one by one we started to see for instance in march 2009 bearishness really going off the chart uh, negativity was at a crescendo fever pitch our own clients you know were, were relaying to us how how they felt and it was a very negative feeling we we saw you know things like Schiller price earnings ratios get much more favorable. So again, pieces of the puzzle started fitting together. We started taking on more risk in a stepwise fashion. And again, we don't have to be exact at either the top or the bottom. We just simply have to be uh, in, the, in the right vicinity. Right now, as we said several times in January 2013. Risks are very high, but we frankly have thought that risks have been high for well over a year. So we're quite early in the game, this go around, and being uh, relatively conservative, we, we're still producing decent returns. Of course, it's not always possible to match the S&P in any given year because we're, we're never really 100% invested, nor would our clients want us to take that risk. But we have found that this strategy of identifying risk retreating to cash and out of risk assets to, to some extent when risk is high gives us the ability to avoid the majority of drawdowns and have ammunition if you will to deploy you know when, when things get looking like they're at the other extreme like they like they did in march 2009 frankly also march 2003 was another time i can recall the statue coming down in baghdad um, you know it was another time when everyone wanted to be out of stocks that was a good time to get in the market and 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 enjoy a little bit of a bull run. So you have to be able to, uh, for our clients, we think we have to be willing to do the opposite of what they feel like doing. We have to do the opposite of what most people want to do. Uh, that can make it very difficult, and as we said, timing is always uh, very hard to, to get exactly right. But uh, you know, we view ourselves as disciplined risk managers that deploy assets in the proper way um, and maintain uh, an emotional discipline that that many of our clients can't or don't want to do on their own, and they and they ask us to do it for them. Chris, if I could just add on to that, you know, so um, you know, lest the listeners here get this this uh, vision of us kind of you know looking at our finger and holding it up to to kind of get a sense for which way the wind is blowing. You know, we we actually have a, a kind of a you know systematic tool chest, if you will, to to help us uh, objectively 
measure risk env- the risk environment. You know, so we, we rely on both kind of what we'll generally call technical analysis uh, as well as fundamental research uh, to enable us to, to objectively really measure and get a sense. And just like, you know, forecasting the weather, it's not a perfect science, but you have, uh, you know, a, you can have a model or a system that is very good at getting uh, uh, reasonably accurate reads on, 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 on the environment. Um, so, you know, uh, as I mentioned, we use, some te- we, uh, we use a number of technical indicators that, uh, you know, uh, aren't so much, uh, you know, centered on asking the question why something is happening or, or behaving the way it is in the market, but, but really measuring what, what actually is happening. You know, what are people doing with their, their feet insofar as how, how they're, they're moving markets with their, with their actual investment decisions. Uh, but we also focus uh, very uh, intensively on on independent uh, independent f- fundamental research. You know, uh, your research and and uh, contributors to your to your site uh, are are, are great um, I- input to our macro uh, thinking. Other folks, uh, there there are countless other folks that we uh, re- you know read and digest their independent research. You know, the likes of folks like uh, John Hussman of the Hussman Funds, Ed Easterling of Crestmont Research. These are just a couple of uh, independent fundamental research uh, analysts who have a great body of research in, you know, identifying the sets of conditions that time and time again, if you look historically, have been reliable indicators of when are acceptable times to take risk and when, when are not. Uh, John Hussman refers to these kinds of sets of conditions as, as syndromes, which we, we think is quite an appropriate way to describe it. You know, what are the syndromes that typically are present uh, in terms of actual measurable data that have, historically speaking, been the environments where it's turned out to be a bad time to take risk. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we rely on to objectively get a sense for what the risk environment is. Not our own ego, not our own intellect, but really uh, objective measurement of, of, of fundamental and technical data points. All right, so we've got a, a dynamic approach to asset allocation that relies on experience, uh, a systematic uh, toolkit uh, for assessing risk. You've got uh, a variety of voices that you listen to, many of whom are are sharing your uh, penchant for looking at things as objectively, as measurably, as uh, dispassionately, if I can use that word. Uh, and you've got an emphasis on precious metals, some other three E-themed investments. Are there any additional tools that you use here? Yes, Chris. There, there are definitely some other tools um, that I'd like to uh, ex- explain just in, in kind of broad con- conceptual terms. We do use tools um, known as options in our accounts to smooth out risk and to protect the uh, the portfolios. Things like put options we'll use from time to time. And, and, and frankly, a put option is simply very much like buying homeowner's insurance, if I could make that analogy. If you buy, uh, and most of us that own a home will have a homeowner's insurance policy. In fact, we'll be required to if we have a mortgage. Uh, you pay a certain amount of money into the policy if something happens to the house, it burns down, the insurance pays off. Put options are very, very, very similar to that. We would risk, say, um, to give you an approximate example, we might risk, let's say, 0.25% of an account in terms of premium paid for this insurance over the next four months in exchange for the uh, fact that we'll have protection if that portfolio declines, the value of the put option will increase. So that's one strategy we use. Others, when volatility is high, we might we might use other types of options. For instance, there's a type of option called the call option that we can sell uh, in a portfolio to bring additional income into that portfolio. And, and quite simply, what it allows you to do is take additional income uh, into the account um, you do potentially give a little bit of upside away. For, for instance, you might sell call options in an account and say, I'll take all of the gains for the next 10%, but anything above that, um, I'll, I, I'll lose those gains because of that option I sold. But really what you get is, well, first of all, you get that 10% gain if the market goes up that much or more, plus the premium that you took in for the call option. Long story short, the, the, the call option strategy is good for increasing income, reducing volatility, and giving you a little bit of downside protection. We use those strategies more when volatility is high because, frankly, you get higher premiums for call options when volatility is high. When volatility is low, like right now, we would probably use and have used more put options because volatility is a key component in the prices of options. So we can buy put options 
and, uh, and, and have good protection in portfolios. And if there's a waterfall type event, we're going to have good protection and we didn't have to pay a lot for that protection. So we'll use these tools when appropriate. I should offer the brief legal disclosure that uh, no one should get involved in using options and, unless they're well versed and uh, have read the proper disclosures and understand the risks uh, of various option strategies. The other thing that we'll sometimes use uh, are, are things called inverse investments. There are exchange-traded funds, for instance, or mutual funds that offer participation in certain markets uh, to, to the inverse of those markets. For instance, we um, might look at an ETF that uh, participates negative 100% to the uh, to the movement of the S&P or maybe even negative 200%. So we'll put those on from time to time as well. Again, just adding, adding, you know, again, those have their own sets of risks, like like options, and folks who you know might pursue those those approaches should be very versed in the risks. You know, for example, these inverse investments oftentimes will have things like tracking risk, which you know uh, we, we don't necessarily have to get into in detail today, but it's, it's just something that one needs to be very uh, aware of before they venture into the use of those tools. So the summary of, of these sorts of strategies, uh, the options as well as the inverse investments, would be a way to generate some additional return in a return-starved world and uh, for the insurance benefits that they can offer. And so really what we're, what we're accepting here is uh, the concept of a higher um, risk-adjusted return. Is, is that a fair way to look at that? I would say so, Chris. Absolutely, a higher risk-adjusted return, and, and really, what we're looking for is a higher risk-adjusted return over, over a, a complete market cycle, if you will, uh, or over a longer period of time. Time that's measured, perhaps, in you know, ten-year time frame. This type of strategy is never going to outperform the S and P in the straight-up market, you know, like we had perhaps in 2009, 2010. But it's going to uh, dampen the volatility, if you can imagine. You know, a curve that you know looks very wavy and, and, and very volatile. We're going to dampen that quite a bit with this type of strategy, and avoid the large drawdowns, so that at the end of the period, hopefully, the uh, the participant has has a better risk-adjusted return over that whole time frame. All right. Well, thanks for that. I think that gives me a very uh, good and complete sense of how you're approaching risk in the financial universe. What I'm interested now, you also mentioned that there's another way that you can help clients, and that's uh, assisting with managing non-investment risks. How do you help there? Yeah, I can explain that, Chris. This is John again. So as I mentioned, uh, myself, Mike, and Bill, the three principals of our firm, are, are also certified financial planners. You know, Really, when we work with a client, we recognize that their financial life goes beyond just their investment portfolio. Obviously, their investment portfolio usually is the most significant piece of their financial equation uh, outside of maybe their, their home or business. Uh, but there are, you know, uh, there are other areas that we uh, routinely will assist clients with, and that includes looking at risk to their financial security that go, go beyond, uh, you know, the, what we talked about earlier, you know, throughout this, this podcast, investment risk. You know, so fo- things like, you know, risk to uh, untimely death, you know, uh, you know, risk to their livelihood in the form of disability, uh, for example, if they're not able to perform their, their work duties and, and therefore their income streams are, are, are interrupted. Uh, health risks, you know, as, as folks get older, things like long-term care insurance uh, becomes possibly relevant, um, certainly with the increasing likelihood of, of folks with advances in medical care. You know, it used to be folks used to die sudden deaths. You know, now typically, you know, older folks deal with degenerative disease, which, you know, plays out over many years, if not decades, and, and oftentimes requires, you know, long-term medical care, which can be very expensive. These are all types of risks that could be very effectively, and we would say cost-effectively, dealt with through the use of insurance. You know, we are licensed to provide different forms of insurance to, to clients, uh, like life insurance, like disability or long-term care insurance. And, and we are not agents of any one insurance company. We are uh, independent insurance advisors, so we have access to you know, dozens of, of different companies so we can we can shop around to get the best deal for our clients. And, of course, we're only going to advise the use of these, tool, these tools where and when they're appropriate for clients. You know, we, we find ourselves spending time sometimes more often telling clients they don't need insurance they already have because they can self-insure more effectively or, you know, in the case of, for example, life insurance, someone that's got $10 million in the bank probably doesn't have a financial justification for having additional life insurance. Maybe from an estate planning standpoint they might, 
to to uh, avoid uh, you know, or, or diminish some estate tax uh, implications. But um, you know, so so that is one very important part of what we can do for clients. Um, look at their overall picture. You know, the best investment strategy could could be unraveled with an untimely death of a of a, a, a young young spouse, for example, or or the dis- disability that interrupts someone's future earnings capability because they can't go go to work. Um, we also, you know, we don't, for example, um, we're not we're not uh, property and casualty insurance agents. We don't sell home or auto insurance, but nonetheless, that is a very uh, important area of of risk in the form of typically liability that clients um, have, whether they realize it or not. So we'll oftentimes consult clients. You know, we'll uh, you know advise them about the importance of having a, a robust uh, auto or home insurance policy with proper liability uh, limits. And also talk about things like an umbrella liability policy, which, as the, as the name implies, serves as an umbrella over and above one's own auto and home liability policies to provide a, an additional level level of liability protection. And oftentimes we'll refer folks to uh, a property and casualty insurance agent, or 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 talk uh, uh, with them and their own you know chosen uh, PNC agent to make sure that they're properly covered. And after all, we want to make sure the full picture of our clients' you know, financial risk profile is attended to. I've been completely counting on Social Security to take care of my retirement needs. Should I not have been doing that? <laughs> I'm not sure how to respond to that other than laugh. Uh, that's, yeah, no, I would say that no, Chris. Uh, it's, it's, it's best to, uh, to prepare yourself. Uh, I, I'm sure that Social Security will be there in some form for most of us, but Adequate preparation is going to be vital, I think, for, for, for all of us. Folks uh, that aren't schooled or, or, or students of the history of Social Security, at the time Social Security was rolled out, you know, the life expectancy of a, of a typical person was you know, much less than it is now. So, so when, when it was rolled out, it was never meant to be a, a, a 20 or 30 year retirement vehicle. It was meant to be a safety net should someone survive two or three years beyond their, their retirement age. Now with folks living you know, 25, 30, 40 years even in retirement, uh, we would, you know, say objectively the whole premise of Social Security is, is, it has, has been challenged. Um, and, and so that, that should give proper context uh, in, into the ongoing debates on how, uh, not, not if, but how uh, that program should be restructured, in, 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 restructured in, in light of our, our fiscal challenges here, here in the good old United States of America. Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the more important areas for me and, and, and many of my listeners that I know you help people with in the non-investment side is also really advising people to do things like pay down debts and invest in their homestead and uh, get some physical gold and, and put it out of the system or, or someplace safe and secure. There are a variety of other uh, uh, dovetailed sorts of pieces of advice that you you regularly and routinely work with people that all ta- speak to how we can control the larger risks such as they are, even knowing that, that there's nothing any of us can really do about macro uh, monetary policy or the fiscal dysfunction that seems to be pervading Washington, D.C., and yet there are many things that we can do individually in our lives where you know, the concept of an investment's been stretched. It's it's something more than just giving your money to Wall Street and hoping for the best. It includes investing in yourself, in your home, your property, your community, other things like that. And I, I love that, that you've been uh, very actively uh, walking people through that as part of the process on the non-investment side throughout. Thank you, Chris. That's important to us. Yeah, if we do our jobs right, you know, uh, at the end of the day, what our clients should be feeling is, is peace of mind, just, you know, uh, as it relates to their financial security, peace of mind, and and that's where things like resiliency, you know, one's, investing in one's own resiliency has has huge dividends. If nothing else, it fosters a peace of mind that very few other actions can achieve, and can be fun. You know, gardening certainly is a uh, can can foster peace of mind as it relates to uh, being able to secure a healthy diet for oneself, but it it can also be fun. And and uh, I personally have found that through my own pathway in life but you know what what we fear the most is is the change that sets us free um, and and sometimes investing differently uh you know building resiliency and all these different things that one can do uh, are, are great um adders to our own peace of mind and, and happiness <laughs> i guess we could say well we always get wonderful feedback from people that you've been working with because you you really do help them and and most importantly talk to them realistic ways about what the risks really are rather than trying to minimize or poo-poo or, or in some way 
try and convince them that, that they have unrealistic concerns because there's plenty to be concerned about, obviously. And, and, and we don't always have all the right answers and, uh, having, knowing that and just knowing that we, we have to do the best we can stay nimble, uh, remain dynamic in our, our, in our outlooks. All of this is, is really important. So I love the fact that you guys are curious. We have uh, great, uh, discussions every so often about macro market conditions and where things are headed. And, and, uh, I just, I just love the, all the all the richness and data and viewpoints that you're constantly obviously incorporating into your views. So listen, this all sounds perfectly rational, sensible. Uh, that's why I love working with you guys, uh, Mike and John. It's all the time we have today, but I really want to thank you so much for sharing what you did with us today, talking to us about those risks, and for bringing, I think, a much needed dose of clarity to financial matters. Thank you, Chris. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, and uh, we consider it a uh, an honor. Thank you, Chris, and thanks uh, the folks who uh, took the time to listen. We hope you found some uh, nuggets of wisdom in, in what we had to say here today. I'm sure they did. All right. Bye-bye, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Good day.